So let me move swiftly on to my third example of unexpected ways in which the Royal Society makes the world a better place, and that is the wonderful case of the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Now, I first came across Thomas Bayes while looking for notable vicars for a book I was working on, and the book that was recently published called At Home, which is loosely about my own home and old rectory in Norfolk. My house was built in 1851, and one of the things that was notable about country parsons in those days was that they were pretty, generally pretty well educated, uh, pretty well off, and had a lot of time on their hands. And so many of them did a number of extraordinary things. If I may quote from my own book. Sorry, I've lost the page. The last thing I said to myself as I left to come here tonight was, don't forget to mark that page, Bill. <laughs> this is just some examples of, of clergymen in the 19th century and the sorts of things they did. George Bailden, a vicar in a remote corner of Yorkshire, had such poor attendances at his services that he converted, converted half his church into a hen house, but became a self-taught authority, authority in linguistics and compiled the world's first dictionary in Icelandic. <laughs> Not far away, Lawrence Stern, vicar of a parish in New York, wrote popular novels of which the life and, and opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman is much the best remembered. Edmund Cartwright, rector of a rural parish in Leicestershire, invented the power loom, which in effect made the Industrial Revolution truly industrial. In Devon, the Reverend Jack Russell bred the terrier that shares his name, while in Oxford, the Reverend William Buckland wrote the first scientific description of dinosaurs and, not incidentally, became the world's leading authority on coprolites, fossilized feces. Thomas Robert Malthus in Surrey wrote an essay on the principle of population, which, as you will all recall from your school days, suggested that increases in food supply could never keep up with population growth for mathematical reasons. The Reverend William Greenwell of Durham was a founding father of modern archaeology, though he is better remembered among anglers as the inventor of Greenwell's glory, the most beloved of all trout flies. In Dorset, the Perkley named Octavia, Octavius Pickard Cambridge became the world's leading authority on spiders, while his contemporary, the Reverend William Shepherd, wrote a history of dirty jokes. <laughs> John Clayton of Yorkshire gave the first practical demonstration of gas lighting. The Reverend George Garrett of Manchester invented the submarine. Adam Bubble, Buddle, a botanist vicar in Essex, was the eponymous inspiration for the flowering Buddleia. The Reverend John Mackenzie Bacon of Berkshire was a pioneering hot air balloonist and the father of aerial photography. And so it goes on. It was just the most amazing run of, of, of distinction by, by clergymen in the 19th century and indeed in the 18th century. But perhaps the most extraordinary of all of these people, and certainly my favorite, was the Reverend Thomas Bayes whom I like so much that I included him not only in my own book, but also in my introduction to seeing further. Bayes was from Tunbridge Wells in Kent, and he was by all accounts a hopeless preacher, but a brilliant mathematician. At some point, he devised a very complex mathematical equation that has come to be known as the Bayes theorem. Now, people who understand the theorem can use it to work out various probability distributions of all kinds. It's a way of, of arriving at statistical likelihoods based on partial information. The remarkable feature of Bayes' theorem is that it had no practical applications at all in his own lifetime. You need very powerful computers to do the volume of calculations necessary to arrive at useful computations. So in Bayes' day, it was simply an interesting but fundamentally pointless exercise. <laughs> Bayes evidently thought so little of his theorem that he didn't even bother to publish it. It was a friend who sent it to the Royal Society two years after Bayes' death, where it was published in the Society's Philosophical Transactions. In fact, it was a milestone in the history of mathematics. Today, Bayes' theorem is used in countless ways, in modeling climate change, in interpreting radiocarbon dates, in social policy, astrophysics, stock market analysis, weather forecasting, and wherever else probability is an issue. And it exists today simply because nearly 250 years ago, someone at the Royal Society decided it was worth preserving just in case. I think that is the most marvelous thing.